This is a production of Cornell University. Today I'm going to give you a little bit of um, a couple different things. Uh, first is a bit of an overview of the cider market, kind of understanding why it's important to be researching hard cider right now. Uh, secondly, a bit of a, of a travelogue from some um, visits I made to the UK a couple of years ago to understand a little bit about their cider economy, their cider supply chain, how they're producing cider there, and then um, finish off talking about some of our ongoing research and trying to draw some threads between um, historic uh, trends in, in cider production and what we're currently doing to try to, try to push the industry forward. Um, so it's about the apples, and so I'm a horticulturalist, and um, in fact, you know, we're, we're trying to make the case that we can be um, we, meaning New York State, can be the, the epicenter for cider production in the U.S. Uh, because of our, of our market, because of our uh, hi historic apple production here in the state, and uh, because of the large consumer base that is in close proximity to our main apple growing regions. So just a little bit of terminology and defining terms. And for those of you from overseas, whether it's from the U.K. or New Zealand, when um, people said cider, it was understood that you're talking about an alcoholic beverage. Here in the States, when we say cider, people think um, that brown, cloudy juice that you'd buy from the Cornell Orchards, for example, or from um, you know, any other cider apple producer you get with the cider donut um, you know, in the fall. So when I say cider today, I'm always talking about the alcoholic beverage, which we in the States usually refer to as hard cider. So um, it comes from apples, right? So here's cider, here's a cloudy juice, or it can be filtered. Um, they don't drink as much apple juice overseas. That was one of the really interesting things I learned about. And maybe a little bit more in recent times, but historically they didn't drink this um, really clear juice that we uh, grew up on, or you know, the kids in the US grew up on. So hard cider fermented right, yeast fermentation, taking the sugar, converting it to alcohol. Um, legally defined as being below 8.5% ABV, alcohol by volume. So um, by comparison, uh, wines, or I mean, a beer is anywhere from like 3.2 for like the mass produced beers up to 6, 7 for some of the um, uh, kind of more craft uh, beers. Can I have some cider, Nina? <laughs> So, um, and um, wine typically is, um, you know, somewhere between 11 and 15%, depending on the style. So cider kind of hits that middle mark. It's, it's right in between. Ranges anywhere from five to eight and a half is pretty typical. The eight and a half cutoff is not based on the chemical composition, you know, the sugar content of the apples, as much as it is for um, regulatory reasons, historic reasons. And uh, the cider industry is continually trying to push that envelope higher, but gets a lot of pushback from the wine industry that wants it, um, doesn't want ciders to be, have the higher alcohol content. Um, if cider is allowed to get um, oxidated and um, there's acetobacter around, it turns to vinegar. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, products that can be made from distillation. Um, Eau de Vie is a clear um, spirit which comes right off of the still, very strong. Um, if you age it in barrels, oak barrels, you'll make brandy. So Calvados is the traditional apple brandy. It's made in, in France, and we have some producers here in the States now. And then if you take your Calvados, your brandy, and you mix it with, with some of the hard cider, you'll get Pomo, which is this really nice aperitif. There's also this product that we have a history of making in the US called Applejack. And this is where you take the fermented cider and you let it to freeze in, the, in, your, you know, in your backyard or wherever, and you freeze or, or cryo distill it, um, distill it, and that concentrates the alcohols. Now, so it concentrates the ethanol, which is what a lot of people were hoping to do, but it's also concentrating those other alcohols that, have, that were naturally made through the fermentation process, but are uh, very dangerous to drink for human health reasons. Um, so if you're a hobbyist, you can make um, 100 gallons for your own use or 200 in your entire household. And so when I talk about cider apples, I'm talking about um, very specific uh, 
um, class of apples. Um, these are apples that have, um, in particular, a high tannin concentration. So tannins are a subset, uh, it's a functionally defined subset of polyphenols that um, uh, are defined because they used to tan leather, you know, turn leather brown. But now we think of tannins in, in terms of food as those chemicals that lend themselves towards bitterness or astringency. Okay, and so we'll taste them in, in a few minutes. Um, it's uh, what allows um, the craft end of the cider industry to make these more wine-like products that have a lot more mouthfeel to them are, are the tannins. So that's a really important thing. And it's what we don't have commonly, and I'll show you the data in a few slides, that we don't have very high levels of in our culinary apples, right? Because these are fairly unpleasant um, compounds to eat um, if you were to have them in too high a concentration. So they have these four classifications. It was originally uh, classified probably in the late 1800s, but first documented in about 1910. And it's from the Long Ashton Research Center, which is now a defunct uh, research center in, in the United Kingdom. But they came up with these, um, these classes, bitter sweets, bitter sharps, sharps and sweets based on their percent of tannins and then the other um, <laughs> chemical group there, they were um, classifying apples with was malic acid. So if it's above a certain threshold, then it's a sharp apple. Below that, it would be a sweet apple. Craig, I see that certain of these cultivars are listed as crab apples. Mm -hmm. Is that purely a size <laughs> criterion? Oh, OK. So what is a crab apple, you're asking? So, um, all, uh, so a crab apple is um, basically a, mostly a species, a malus species. So malus domestica is the apple you're familiar with, right? It's a hybridized apple. Um, from Malus severcii from region of, we now know as Kazakhstan, and then it hybridized with Malus silvestris, with silvestris, which is a European crab apple. There's other hybridization events and other domestication. It's a kind of a complicated story than that, but that's the basis of it. Anything that is not domestica, so any of these species or any even hybrids are typically called crab apples. So we have several uh, Malus species that are native to the US we refer to them as crab apples. So it's not a very uh, precise term, um, but it's what we're familiar with. And, and any apple that contains sugar can be fermented and turned into cider. So there's no reason why other malice species cannot be used for cider production. <coughs> so a little bit about the markets. Um, the United Kingdom is the biggest market in the world. About 45% of all cider is consumed there. Um, the rest of Europe, consumes about another 20% and the US is about 10% of the, of the world cider consumption, but it's uh, growing significantly. Um, and so there is now about um, just shy of a thousand producers throughout the US. Every state, I've worked with producers in Hawaii, Texas and Alaska now. Um, so not areas that are traditionally known as apple producing regions or making cider. Um, and they're making about 50 million gallons a year. It's kind of um, edging up from that a little bit, but that was the last year I was able to get data from the TTB. And you can see there's a high concentration of cider producers with these little um, balloon dots in the northeastern US, primarily in our apple growing region along the Great Lakes, and then also in Washington state. Uh, and, and I forgot to say very importantly, New York is the, um, has more cider producers than any other state. We used to have a lot more, and, and Michigan is now um, just one producer behind us. So uh, we had very favorable legislation early on by the New York State government that uh, called the Farm Cidery License that made a pretty low barrier for entry for people to open up cideries and it allowed a, um, a really quick um, <coughs> increase in the number of producers. Other states have followed that trend in, in Michigan in there. So why are we talking about cider? Well, um, the growth has been um, very impressive, tenfold in the last 10 years. Um, if we were to do a little back of the napkin calculation on it and assume you get about three gallons of cider in a bushel, bushel is like a 42 pound box, you know, those wooden or, or cardboard boxes, that's a bushel of apples, you get about three gallons out of that. Then um, the amount of cider being um, made in, in 2014 and 15 would have been equivalent to 7% of the entire US apple crop. 
So that's pretty impressive, but it's not in fact 7% of the US apple crop because a lot of the producers are importing apple juice concentrate from places like China, Poland, um, Brazil, and even some bittersweet apple juice concentrate is now coming into the US from England and France. Um, and you can kind of see, you know, it's a relatively small market share compared to wine. So 1.3, 1.5 billion um, right now is the size of the cider market. Uh, beer is the largest alcohol um, industry in the US, about $100 billion, and wine's about $35 billion. So the uh, trends are that we, there, there, there's, not, there's not been an increase in alcohol consumption. Okay, so increases in one of these uh, segments, one of these um, you know, types of products is, means that it's pulling consumers from another one. So cider consumers are coming a lot from the craft beer, uh, craft beer consumers, right? People who are used to experimenting with um, you know, all sorts of different kinds of flavoring, different beer styles are starting to buy craft ciders. Um, less so from the wine, um, consumers, but we're starting to see some wine consumers now buying ciders. So um, that's where it's going. There's also been um, a bit of a decrease in cider sales and consumption uh, from the last couple years, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So a little bit more about just trying to understand like where do ciders fit in. If we're compared it to um, just in New York State between cideries, wineries, and breweries, there's about 100 in, uh, cideries in New York. They are, um, uh, we have about 400, we have about 40,000 acres of apples, but only 200 acres of cider apples. We did some work with Harvest New York to try to understand you know, the scale of the industry. And they're making about 50 million gallons a year. Wineries, um, and so it seems like a lot. Boy, you know, we had a saturation point for cideries here. Um, but then if you look at wineries, there's 450. In the state, there's over 200 in the Finger Lakes alone, and there's 400 breweries in the state. Um, in terms of overall production of the fruit, there's um, a lot more apple acres in the state than, than uh, wine grape acres, but only 200 of our apple acres are really cider apples. Um, and then breweries uh, has kind of a similar issue with the supply chain, right? There's 400 breweries in the state, but not very much in the way of production of, of hops or barley in the state. And so for these uh, craft or uh, farm uh, liquor license, so the craft, I'm sorry, the farm cidery license or the farm brewery license, you um, need to be using New York State grown ingredients. Okay, so for the cider, you're supposed to be sourcing 100% apples from New York State to have a farm cidery license. For the breweries, um, they were supposed to initially be getting their raw ingredients from New York State, but we just don't have it, right? We have apples. We may not have the specialized ones, but we have apples. Um, but we do not have the hops or the barley acreage. There's some increases in there, but it's happening very, very slowly. So is there a cider bubble? Um, there was a bit of a downturn in the market 2016 and 17, and I think a lot of that was because there was such a rapid increase. A lot of that increase um, can be attributed to one company, which is Angry Orchard. And they have about 60% of the market share for cider in the US right now. They were not making cider 10 years ago, right? So um, Angry Orchard is owned by Boston Beer Company, which also makes, anybody know? Sam, Sam Adams, yep, and Mike's Hard Lemonade. And they have a, a hard seltzer product now. Um, so they're you know, exploring different, um, uh, different uh, segments of the alcohol market. Um, but, their, but their cider um, went from zero to 60. They increased and they kind of took the foot off the pedal a little bit in 2016 and 17, just to try to understand where they were at, see if they wanted to continue to grow or if they, you know, we're kind of at that point where they felt like they had market saturation and there aren't going to be any more cider consumers than what they had. Um, but something changed. And um, so that's your first tasting today. And um, millennials love pink, apparently. And so about 2016, 2017, there was a huge increase in rosé wines 
And then 2017 and 18, we saw the same thing happen in ciders. And so the market has had a huge uptick in the last um, year, year and a half, primarily because of, of rosé ciders. So if you haven't had it yet, you can take a taste of it. It's a um, largely made from apple juice concentrate. Um, they do use some red fleshed apples. There are some apples that have anthocyanins in the flesh as well as on the peel, right? The red color is anthocyanins. But, you know, we have 200 acres of cider apples in the state. We maybe we have 200 trees of red fleshed apples being grown commercially. Um, a lot of planting going on. A lot of nurseries are being asked for red fleshed apples right now uh, because of this and because this is seeing such a big increase in the market share. But consumers buy with their eyes and pink is in right now. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about cider from um, other parts of the world. And so in 2017, two years ago or so, a year and a half ago, I got to make a couple trips to the United Kingdom. I went first with this group of folks here. Um, this was a nonprofit based in Hudson River Valley. They got funding from Angry Orchard. They worked with the Cider Association. And it's a group of um, cider apple growers and cider producers. And uh, we got to tour through cider apple orchards in the UK and taste some ciders as well, but mostly we were there to look at, um, at their production, their apple orchards. Um, so just by comparison um, between the UK, the US and New York now, if we look at domestic sales, I said it's the largest cider market in the world, they're about 4 billion. US is 1.5 billion, and so it's, it's growing significantly. Um, New York, maybe about 44 million. Um, in terms of domestic sales. Their acreage, they have about, uh, about 35, 36,000 acres of apples in the UK in total. About half of those are cider apples, okay? In the US, we have about um, uh, 325,000 acres of apples. We have no idea how many cider apple acres are in the US. There's no surveying happening at the national scale. Uh, in New York, we have about 40,000 acres of apples total, maybe 100. 200 acres or cider apples. Um, so you can get some relative sense of their industry. It's huge, right? They're the biggest cider market in the world and they grow a lot of apples specifically for, for making hard cider. Um, so this is what their orchards look like. It's, um, they call them bush orchards. They're planted at fairly wide spacing. This is kind of a spacing that we don't use very much anymore in the US, eight by eight feet between trees, 18 feet between rows. Our growers now are planting trees as close to um, a foot and a half apart and 11 feet between rows. Okay, so um, significantly more, um, three, four times as many trees per acre. They're using uh, Dabinet and Michelin primarily for their varieties. They've kind of figured out what two varieties work. They're using semi dwarfing rootstocks. Um, and the key point is that they're uh, mechanically harvesting. And they do this through a series of, of different mechanical events, including the seedling tree. Yep. So it's uh, nut producers in the US will do this, right? A lot of our nuts are, are shaken and then dropped to the ground. About a single shaker will go through and do about 10 acres in, in, a, in a day. And then they go through with these sweeps. You can see all the apples are harvested, ground harvested apples. There's a whole food safety issue that goes with this. So we're doing a lot of work and talking to colleagues around the US about food safety issues. Yep. And they kind of, this is kind of like a, um, if anybody's familiar with potato harvesting, this is kind of similar to the belts they use for picking up potatoes off the ground. Just kind of two roller conveyor belts that go through and just basically smush the apples and pick them up. And they, um, 
you know, will go up in various conveyor belts and then be put into, you know, they don't, they don't have to pick them by hand. They don't have to be very delicate with them. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. This is um, just some different machines that are used in different parts of the country, depending on the scale. These things are like garbage truck size, right? For some of the bigger operations. This is a uh, one that I saw they were custom making at um, Somerset Farm Machinery. It's a half million dollar machine that was being custom designed for a French uh, cider apple um, cooperative. And then they'll just store the apples. Chris, this is, this is post-harvest storage for cider apples in the UK. So they put them in these clamps, they call them. I had to ask, what, is a, what do you keep saying? They're clamps. And so there's basically these concrete bunkers. And so they'll pick them up, they'll dump them in there, and sometimes they'll sit on the ground for a week or two, and then they'll sit in these piles here for a couple more weeks before they get um, picked up with a front end loader and then driven in a truck to the cider mill. So this truck is used for hauling gravel from the quarry most of the year, except for about two months out of the year. And they handle the cider off very delicately. So this metal grate is really important. This is their quality control. What is that quality control for? Anybody know? Huh? Size? No. Nope. The apples all fit through. Just me. Dead animals? Maybe dead animals. But they don't really care as much about that big old thing. People, dead animals or people, you know. Uh, sticks and rocks, primarily rocks. Because if a rock gets into the cider mill and breaks the mill, then the operation is down. So their very condensed harvest window, two, three months out of the year is when they do all the harvesting and processing the fruit at that point. They are not storing the apples for any length of time like we do in our industry for fresh market apples. And now we are for cider apples, which is really interesting and opening up some research avenues for us because nowhere else in the world do they stick apples into a cold storage unit and then pull them out and make cider in June or July, right? They make all their cider in October, November, and December. And you can see what happens to the fruit after all of these operations. Um, pretty ugly. And this was after, um, this photo here was after um, the two, um, guys that they put on the line because I was there that day were pulling out the bad apples. <laughs> so those are went through and through. Okay, so that's kind of a little bit of an overview of, of what I got to see in England and um, I thought I really in, in enjoyed those trips and it was really pretty remarkable to learn how 20,000 acres of apples are being harvested um, when we only have 200 and we hand harvest ours. So a little bit about my cider research program. Um, you know, I kind of have been addressing the cider industry from a number of different angles. Um, done a lot of work looking at the economics of it because that was kind of the first question I got from growers was, is it worthwhile to plant these, right? So an apple orchard costs somewhere around $20,000 an acre to plant. So it's a very expensive proposition. And so if an apple grower is deciding, should I plant Honeycrisp or Snapdragon or Gala or Dabinet or Michelin? Right, so we have done a lot of work with the economics and trying to figure that out. Um, this was some work I did when I was at Virginia. And we did find um, some profitability if they um, were able to get $15 a bushel, which is kind of a price that galas would sell for in the market these days. Um, and they had a fairly low input type of system. Um, we also made these um, customizable spreadsheets that allowed growers to go in and, and figure out their own costs, which are really nice. Uh, but we, we found that as much as I would go out to extension meetings and talk to growers about how to use these, very few of them probably did on their own, right? They just, it was just hard to, you know, outside of a handful to get them to actually go ahead and, and do that. Um, but, you know, they're, they're nice features. Um, but because we developed this custom tool, it allowed us to go ahead and, um, and run some additional models. So we found you know, the first model in Virginia, yeah, there's profitability in it. Um, I got, collected a lot of data when I was in England and I ran their budget on it. 
And so this is for a typical bush type of orchard that's, that's being produced in the UK. Um, this is a, what's called a um, enterprise budget. So after 25 years, it's looking at your profitability. So anything above zero means you're profitable. So these orchards, because um, they're getting very little price, it's a commodity for them to sell these apples. Um, they have these long-term contracts with the main producers. Bulmers buys about half of all the cider apples in the UK. Bulmers is the uh, largest cider producer in the world. They're owned by Heineken. Um, and they don't pay very much, three ninety a bushel, right? So that's uh, well below our prices for even processing fruit. And um, clearly for them, it's not a profitable system. There's other incentives. There's other reasons why some of these orchards can be profitable. There's actually um, animal cropping systems in here. They grease sheep in them. Uh, they get payment for just keeping the land in agricultural production. But, um, but the orchard themselves, if you're just going to do the orchard, would not be profitable. So some key differences when we start thinking about this and, and how can we be um, more profitable in the US. Um, so just trying to understand a little bit about the UK system versus what we're doing here. Um, so they're getting three, 339, I say here, okay, you know, prices were varying a little bit. Um, in the UK, our apple growers are getting between 15 and $30 a bushel for cider apples, because we have, they have a huge supply. I mean, they have a yeah, huge supply and kind of, you know, their demand is kind of maxed out. Whereas we have a huge demand for this fruit and almost no supply, right? 200 acres of cider apples in the U.S. and in New York State. A very low input systems, no trellis system, no irrigation. They don't spray very much and they're mechanically harvesting, right? So they're not having that, um, what is the number one cost for most orchards, which is hand harvesting the fruit, right? It's a huge cost, as well as all of the social issues that go with and political issues that go with having to get a huge labor force to pick the fruit. Um, so like I said, we found that while I kept talking about these Excel spreadsheets that growers can use themselves, they really weren't using them too much. So um, I hired um, Whit Knickerbocker, who graduated uh, in 2015 from, um, from Ag Econ here in, at Cornell, and he went around and did case studies of six different cider apple orchards in New York State. And so collected all the information about their cost of production, their yields, their expected returns, et cetera. And we found that um, you know, these operations varied widely. Um, there was organic, there were conventional, some were trying to do kind of traditional processing orchards, some were doing high density systems. Um, but five out of the six were profitable after, the, um, after 25 years. And really most of them were hitting profitability in this kind of spot between six and eight years where they're crossing that, that line or six and nine years, somewhere in there um, for being profitable, except for this one orchard here, Orchard Six. And that's because they were using the most sophisticated orchard systems available, planting the trees, um, basically um, very close together. Irrigation had very high labor costs and then selling the fruit basically as processing fruit. And it didn't add up, right? I mean, that kind of makes sense. So, um, but a good take home, and we published this in the Fruit Quarterly, which is like the trade magazine for the growers in the state, so that they can understand a little bit about what they're getting into it. Right. Yeah. Uh, you talked about the one that's not doing very well. Mm -hmm. What was the uniqueness about the, uh, the one that is doing very well? So the one that, um, uh, that is Orchard One here, that had the highest profitability, kind of really almost obscene and unbelievable numbers. And I'd probably say, mm, if we, um, you know, so for most of these orchards, we were able to collect empirical data for years one, two, three, maybe some of them we got out to about year five in empirical data. And then these orchards are all so new that we're doing a lot of assumptions for the rest of the time. And um, uh, that orchard was assuming the highest prices um, kind of even better than Honeycrisp in its heyday prices for cider fruit and um, was also, um, uh, I think, underestimating their labor costs. But this is their information and this, these are case studies, you know, so we're, we're just kind of putting in their story. 
So, and, and in fact, it's a good lead in because if we, um, if we took an average price, and so we did, um, we did some survey work in New York. We also looked at surveys in the Pacific Northwest, the upper Midwest, Vermont, and Virginia, and found that the average price of cider apples was probably closer to about 35 cents. And, um, and so we, when we did that, that orchard that was the most profitable using their numbers kind of came out to be in the middle of the pack um, when we use these more standardized numbers. And in fact, the orchard that became the most profitable was the one that most resembled a processing orchard with wider spacing. All right, so let's taste a few apples. I've got two here going around. Um, and I'm just gonna pass them around. The yellow one is called uh, Medal Dior, gold medal in French. And then the red apple is called Porter's Perfection. So the um, way to taste a cider apple, take a bite and chew it up, but don't swallow it yet. And then take that pulp and push it against the roof of your mouth. And you should be able to get those cannons, right? Bitterness and a particularly astringency, right? That, that tactile sensation of dryness, chalkiness, kind of unpleasant. Sometimes we call them spitters, right? I have a garbage can here, but you guys don't. And then Porter's Perfection is a bitter, so that's a bitter sweet is Medal Dior. And then Porter's Perfection is a bitter sharp. I mean, it has both tannins and acidity. It also has this really cool feature, which is called polycarpy. And so the fruit will double. And this happens during um, flower bud development in the previous season. Cherries do this a lot under heat stress. Um, not too many culinary apples do this. Some, mostly doubles, sometimes triples. There's a few in the basket going around too. So polycarpy is the word of the day. So we did some work trying to understand a little bit about hmm, what's in the US market right now uh, that's being grown. And let's see, do you guys get the second cider yet? Yeah. yeah, okay, so second cider then is, um, you can taste the apple, and then it's um, called Eve Cidery, it's a local producer, and about 60% of that juice is bitter, bitter sharp juice. Is there any more of it? <laughs> I didn't get any. Um, and so you should be able to, now that you've tasted the apples, understand a little bit about the, the tannins in there. So, um, if we look at the apples, and a lot of these are the, the kind of traditional uh, fresh market apples and processing apples that you'd find in the mid-Atlantic or northeastern U.S., and a lot of them are over this threshold of 4.5 to be a sharp apple, right, with just a few exceptions, Fuji, Ida Reds, and Red Delicious. And um, so we've got plenty of acidity in, in terms of, like, if we think about it in terms of the palette of apples available, but we don't have is very much in the way of of phenolics, of these tannins, right? So these are the same apples from the study. And you can see our threshold of being bitter would be up close to 2000. Um, and you can see it, most of these are well below that level, right? So these are the exception of a few heirloom varieties like Harrison and Crab that have you know, a fair amount of tannin, but nothing near as much as the Porter's Perfection or the Medal Dior that are going around. So you should really taste those tannins now after having that apple. It should be really apparent to you. <laughs> really different kind of product. Um, you know, different market share, different um, consumer type, I'd say. So we've been doing a lot of work. We've been um, planting different variety trials. Um, we've been importing apples from different parts of the world to get them here. A lot of them are flawed, right? So. Look at these things, they split open. These things rot before you can pick them. Um, they give all sorts of disease problems. This is fire blight, a bacterial disease that will just pretty much outright kill the tree. A lot of the cider apples are really prone to that. Rots, blind wood, which is these long sections of branches without any flower buds on them or even any vegetative buds. Um, really small fruit size, which is okay if you're mechanically harvesting, but not so much if you're going to be um, if you're going to be uh, hand harvesting, right? It takes a lot of time and effort to hand harvest very small fruit like that. Um, so, um, you know, the growers say, okay, we need this elite list. And we've come up with a list of cultivars that we think do well in our climate. 
but I also think that's really important to think about <coughs> maximizing the genetic diversity and really the flavor diversity of cider apples, right? So um, apples, you know, 7,000, probably closer to 14,000 named varieties of apples. And, and to say, well, we should have six or three, which is what the nurseries and some of the big scale uh, growers say they want. You know, I, you know I, I understand that from a commercial perspective, but also greatly appreciate the diversity. And we have this amazing resource um, at Ben Geneva called the um, uh, Plant Genetics Resource Unit. It's a, uh, part of the ARS within USDA and their job is to preserve genetic diversity of different crops. So the one in Geneva is based all on apples. They have about 5,000 unique accessions, unique genotypes there. Um, so this is Nathan in the bottom right and bottom left is David, um, who have both worked on this project. And um, a lot of my lab group have worked on different parts of this project over the last couple years. We're looking at um, about 300 and a little bit more than 300 different accessions from there, from largely from the UK, France and the US, but also you can kind of see we're looking at stuff widely from different countries, as well as a number of quote unquote crab apples. So some hybrids, uh, Malus severcii, which is the main progenitor species of our, our culinary apple, as well as some of these other um, species here to say if um, any of these can be used for production. Uh, so if we were to look at it on the scale of the Long Ashton scale in terms of um, um, a bittersweet, bitter sharp, et cetera, um, from our 2017 harvest, we found about 30% to be bittersweet, you know, and that's because it's a self selected pool, um, and 13 to be bitter sharp. And I think those bitter sharps are the ones that are going to be really interesting, the red dots here to the cider industry, because they have the ones that be potentially made into single variety ciders. And that's kind of something, it's kind of like a, a, a holy grail of cider production, right? Because most of the ciders that you have, and certainly this one here has a mix of, from, from Eve Cidery, um, has a mix of probably um, 10 plus different apple varieties in here. Um, so trying to understand, you know, what these are. A lot of these are, that are way out here, are the species, but even some of these in here. And so if we can find apples that have the juice quality, but also have the horticultural aspects that we're looking for, for cider production, that would be great. We've been working with um, the metabolomics facility also to screen some of these varieties for their, thank you, Nina, um, for their um, polyphenol content. And we found some really interesting things. So this is um, Kingston Black is highlighted. And so that's this apple here. And this is a bitter sharp. It is a terrible apple to grow. It's probably one of the worst apples I've ever seen horticulturally in terms of the tree structure. It kind of grows like this pear. It doesn't produce very much fruit. But it's been talked about for hundreds of years in the literature as being one of the best cider apples, right? So it doesn't grow well. It's very difficult to grow, but has the um, the juice quality and the cider quality that the producers keep talking about. And so what is it about it that makes it so special? Well, it has this, um, this subset of polyphenols, these hydro um, oxycinematic acids, which kind of lend themselves to these smoky notes in, in ciders. And that's kind of been something that um, adds a lot of depth and character to the, to the, um, to the ciders. And so, you know, kind of understanding that has been really interesting. We've been working with um, Kenang Shu's lab also. We're taking that collection of fruit and we're doing some genotyping. So this is using some of his, um, of Kenang's acidity genes. And so, you know, traditionally apples were classified based on their chemical composition, as I've talked about. Uh, we're trying to see if we can come up with a genetic way of, of classifying apples, right? Based on genes, which would be really helpful to have these markers for breeding programs, uh, going through 300 accessions in the germplasm collection, you know, doing all this other thing that I'm doing, which is very slow and time consuming. If we had some genetic markers, it'd be fantastic. So our next up is um, try to work on the polyphenols, which is a lot more complicated from a molecular level because uh, polyphenols are upregulated from so many different biotic and abiotic sources. So a lot of my work has been on, um, you know, what are the pre-harvest and, and in some cases, post-harvest management um, 
uh, influences that would affect the quality of the cider. So kind of this laundry list of things that we've been looking at. A lot of these have been studied for wine grapes and dessert apples, but a lot less so for cider apples, right? There has not been a whole lot of research in cider apples, uh, particularly in the US historically, just because there was no real reason to. This is really good cider. Um, so um, we looked at crop load. So crop load affects so many different aspects of the tree and you can see low, medium and high is being shown here. Um, and what we found was that in the fermented cider that the high crop load, which had smaller sized fruit, had the highest phenolic content in the fermented cider. We didn't see it in the juice, but we did see it in the fermented cider, which is interesting. And um, so we had a couple of follow-up projects on that to try to understand that more. This is David Sakalik here. And so we've been looking at this issue more closely for the past several years at a commercial farm up in, uh, in Lindenville, New York, um, and trying to tease apart, you know, not just one variety, but we're looking at seven different cultivars. Some interesting trends that we found so far um, is that as fruit weight um, increased, you had larger fruit, we had higher phenolic content. So it's a lot, you know, now we're kind of going, well, that's kind of different data than what we saw before. And we're trying to make heads or tails of what's happening in amongst, um, you know, the genetic differences or environmental, what are the specifics that are causing these differences? And so uh, Lindsay Springer, who's a postdoc in my lab now, has a series of projects to really try to break this apart and try to understand this phenomenon because we're getting such contradictory data back. Um, I mentioned about storing apples in um, cold storage, and we actually are finding a positive benefit to that. And so it's kind of um, four different time points is what we're looking at in the different color bars and two different varieties, Dabinet and Benet Rouge, and we see an increase in all these phenolic contents um, after storage. So um, while not done widely in the rest of the world, there could be a benefit to it, um, and that some of these phenolic compounds are are polymerizing in the, um, in the fruit as they age. We have a whole bunch of projects that we're looking at in terms of nitrogen cycle in the orchard. And, and just for the sake of time, I'm just gonna say, hey, if you wanna learn more about that, come talk to me. But we're looking at it at the orchard level, the fermentation level. It's a really important issue in cider because apples have a very low nitrogen content, which leads to hydrogen sulfide production, a rotten egg smell an obvious flaw for, for most consumers. And so we've been spending a lot of time and effort trying to um, tease that apart. Now if you drive around 366, we have this new experimental orchard out there for cider, apple or, um, cider apples. It's high density system um, with the goal of trying to do something like use an over the row harvester. So this is an experimental over the row harvester that was, um, I came across in the UK. Um, so they're thinking about it too and trying to get fruit off of the tree as opposed to off of the ground. So um, do teach a class about this. We have 100 students enrolled in our undergraduate cider production class right now, which is really fantastic. Um, we also do a lab where students get to do the fermentation. We've done some fun projects. Uh, last year we did, we had them go into Wikipedia. The whole Wikipedia entry for cider was subpar, in my opinion. So hopefully we made it better with our students and not worse, but they learned how to go in and do editing in Wikipedia. Um, I worked, uh, and if you've been in Man Library lately, um, it's been up there for a long time, worked with them to digitize, and, and Simon Ignall is here. He did a lot of the digitization for us in this project. Um, we digitized a lot of old texts about um, apples and pomology and, 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 um, and cider, which is beautiful. They get posted on the Biodiversity Heritage Library. But it's also been important from a um, scientific perspective because we have a lot of misnamed varieties in, our, um, in, the, in the US right now. And so we're able to go back and look at foxwhelp here from um, 1811 from the um, Herefordshire Pomona and then compare it to the example that's in the um, USDA collection. Clearly not the same. <laughs> so um, some final thoughts. Um, there's a lot of potential. Um, we don't have very much in the way of acreage here yet, but you know, it's increasing. I know right now, um, I showed a picture earlier of um, 
villa in front of a, of a nursery, an apple tree nursery. Um, and uh, in that nursery alone, about 10% of all that they're growing is for cider apples. So thousands of new cider apple trees are being made each year. And um, a lot of it in the ground. And so we're working with Harvest New York to just try to get a sense of how big it's getting and, and where it's going. Um, and um, another note is while cider has been great, I've also got my eye on Perry. So the third one you had to taste is actually a fermented pear. And so this is made by Tom Oliver in the UK. And if you still have some in your glass, one of the interesting things about um, pears is that they produce a lot of sorbitol and uh, a lot more than apples do. And so sorbitol is um, a non-fermentable sugar. And so it leaves a natural residual sweetness in the product. So I think it's delicious. Um, so I leave, work with a large group. We've got a lot of information on our website. And, um, you know, go visit that and come talk to me. And they got one or two minutes for questions, Don. Absolutely. Yeah. Question for Greg. So I was wondering, in the study looking at the effects of storage on mm -hmm. the content, were the apples kind of battered up? Before storage, like immediately. No, the, so in that study about um, about storing the apples and the increase in phenolics over time, those were hand harvested, um, very well treated apples, not like the ones I showed earlier in the in the lecture today. Uh, yeah, Alan. They have issues with ochre toxins and the, you know with the ground pickup. Yeah. So the is a question. Um, is about uh, like enteropathogenic organisms like patulin and E. coli. Uh, no, because um, uh, the apples, even though they probably, when they're going into the mill, have these organisms on them, um, there's a number of different kill steps. They concentrate the juice up to like 75, 80% sugar content, which is a kill step. Um, it's a heat process. Uh, they use pasteurization sometimes before fermentation and then definitely after fermentation. Um, and they'll also use like sterile filtration through like a 0.45 uh, micron filter. So they have these different kill steps. It's different on the craft end of the industry where there's a lot less control and a lot less kill steps. And so there is a concern, but the kill step there is really the alcohol content. And that most of these organisms are not able to live in a low alcohol solution or um, the, um, the toxins they produce are broken down during the actual you know, process of fermentation. So there's actually a really nice paper put out by some colleagues at WSU um, in the December issue of Hort Technology addressing this. Greg, can you see if Geneva has any questions? Geneva, questions? Oh, you're good. You're good? Okay. <laughs> yeah, Justine. So I think most wine growers, if they were honest, and you caught them at the right time, would, would tell you that they would much prefer to blend rather than make a single varietal wine, right? Gives them a lot more in their toolbox, and then when something's a bit rough in that variety, they're, they're able to cover it. And that's why, you know, through most of the country, it's only 70% uh, of that cultivar has to be there to have the label. So why would the cider producers, why would the Holy Grail be a single cultivar? Because they don't have consumer acceptance driving it like we do in wine. It's a great question. So the question is, um, why is it a holy grail for the cider industry to have these single variety ciders and to be able to put Kingston Black Cider on their label? Uh, uh, I don't know exactly, but um, it, it, you know, I think it's because of the U.S. wine industry and because so many wines are marketed as um, Riesling or Pinot Noir or um, you know by their variety name and. Um, so it kind of has been, and it's not just our current producers in the U.S. It's you go back and read some of this old literature that we were scanning in, and they talk about, um, you know, how this this variety makes this excellent single variety cider. And the apple industry so, has always thought in terms of varieties. As, as, yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think there is a marketing angle to it from a production standpoint, and certainly from the growers perspective, you're absolutely right, right? More varieties means diversity, which means you have crop failure or an off year on one variety, you'll have something else to fill in the gap. And if you're depending on that one variety and you don't have it that year for whatever reason, it's a difficult marketing strategy to have. <laughs>
Yeah, in wine, it's consumers that drive that, and it's older consumers. Not yeah, not the not the younger consumers. Yeah, interesting. One more question. How concentrated can you get the alcohol in, in that? Was it the Applejack? Oh, and, and then sort of follow up. So the problem is, <laughs> when we read about you know 100, 150 years Why ago, do you want to know? people yeah. drank a lot of cider, but would they have actually drank Applejack because it would store longer? So okay, so Marvin's asking a couple questions about Applejack. First is how strong does it get in terms of alcohol content? I don't know exactly. I would say you probably get to two, three times the initial concentration. So I'd guess somewhere in the 20s to 30 percent um, ABV alcohol by volume would be my guess but I've never made it um, and don't know and you know uh, in terms of historically Applejack was um, widely consumed pre-prohibition era um, because it was a cheap source of of high you know high proof booze essentially and so um, and in fact a lot of the temperance movement was a um, was in reaction to uh, the consumption of Applejack because not only was it cheap and there was a lot of it around, but because of these other alcohols that were in the product, it was you know had a lot of negative health impacts. And so um, yeah, that's the story. People used to go blind, and certainly probably a lot of people became alcoholic from drinking. Um, cheap Applejack, historically. My mother was a member of the Women's mm -hmm. Christian Temperance Union. So I'll tell her that when I see her. <laughs> I want to thank Greg for an absolutely fascinating seminar. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.